Well, good morning, friends, and welcome, City Lights, friends of City Lights, wherever you are, wherever you're listening to us from. Uh, welcome to our gathering this morning. Uh, it's wonderful, again, to be back together again. Uh, wonderful to be gathering in this way. And uh, I trust and pray that you've had an incredible week, that you've met with the Lord on many occasions, that you've seen His hand working, and uh, and that you've had, had reason and an opportunity to extend your faith to extend hospitality, to extend love and grace to people around you. We are city lights. We are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Uh, the life of Christ in us shines uh, brightly in the dark. For that, we are incredibly grateful. I want to greet you and just say hi to everybody. If you're meeting with us in this way for the very first time, welcome. It's good to have you with us. And uh, I pray that this morning... You have already been blessed. Perhaps you've spent some time praying. Perhaps you've already been worshiping the Lord to some CDs or, or, or some music of your own. And uh, now as we come into this corporate time together, um, I, I pray that, that you would be greatly, greatly encouraged. Encouraged by our togetherness. Encouraged by the fact that, that you're not alone. That many people come to gather the Lord together, uh, to the Lord together. And also encouraged by the fact that uh, that God is at work and God is moving in your life, in your home, in our city, in our nation, and around the world. God is moving. I pray this morning that you will be greatly, greatly blessed. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to meet together as the church. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the homes and uh, and places that we are hearing your word from this morning and gathering in this morning. Thank you that you've given us uh, roofs over our head, warmth, uh, people around us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've given us this community, the church, and we just want to celebrate the church with you this morning, celebrate the wonder of the church uh, with you this morning. Thank you, God, for the incredible character and nature of the bride of Christ, that we are one family together in, 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 uh, because of Jesus. We bless you, Lord God. I pray that this time that we spend together uh, in your word and in fellowship, that you would you would encourage us, that you would teach us, that you would train us, that your Holy Spirit would come and dwell with us and within us. And uh, because of today, we would not we, we, we would never be the same again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your loving kindness and for your grace. Amen. 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 Well, I wanted to start off this morning uh, with a quick clip, a video clip from Stephen Ryan. It's, uh, Steve is, is the lead elder at uh, Jubilee Christian Community Church in Cape Town. Steve is also uh, one of our leaders in advance, in our advanced network. And uh, a little bit after the president spoke a couple of days ago, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, we had the president come and speak to us. Some people were excited about that and encouraged other people were a little discouraged by it, but Steve produced an, an, a, a, a short clip uh, to train and teach us and to, to kind of set our perspectives right in this time. And I thought that I, it would be a great uh, addition to our meeting and gathering this morning. So I'm going to press play on that now, and we're going to watch that together and see what Steve encourages us to do. Uh, let's watch Steve. Thanks. Hey everybody, uh, hope you're well. Just want to spend a couple of minutes just getting us to think about politics uh, and the pandemic. Uh, the first thing that I want us to think about when we uh, think about politics and the pandemic is just to firstly acknowledge pressure. All of us are living in very pressurized environments and normally pressurized environments don't cause us to respond in the most mature way. Indeed, not only do we not respond in a mature way, but often we don't react to somebody's immature response. And it's just worth being aware of the pressure cooker that we're in as we begin to uh, relate to each other around the topic of uh, politics and uh, particular implementation of policy. The second thing that I want us to be aware of is uh, what I'm calling uh, principle versus personal. Whenever you go through a difficult time uh, or a uh, loss, that obviously impacts you in a personal way. And it's absolutely right to mourn and grieve the loss that you're going through. 
But often when we're going through difficulties and loss and challenge, we can then uh, begin to blame others for the difficulties that we're going through. We can move from personal pain to a principled objection as if somebody were doing something uh, fundamentally wrong or even perhaps evil. And I just invite you at this moment of time as we're facing this coronavirus just to have a wider perspective that we are going through a global pandemic and people that are trying to lead uh, countries and institutions don't have the playbook for this. They, they, they are uh, trying to respond to a crisis that they don't think that they are prepared for. And therefore, I would um, urge us not to jump immediately to principled errors. There may be uh, principled errors at some time, and maybe that would be appropriate, but rather to reflect on the fact that you are going through personal pain and uh, lament there and try to seek uh, grace and help from God. Next, I want you to think about personal freedom. One of the wonderful things about Christianity is that because our identity is in Christ and because we're followers of God, what defines us isn't our political opinion on a particular issue, but rather on what Jesus Christ has done for us. This also means that as Christians, we are free to hold different political opinions. Uh, this was brought to my attention in a wonderful way uh, a, a couple of years back where I was in the UK at the time uh, of the Brexit election and one of the couples that lead uh, our church uh, in the UK actually voted differently uh, on the topic of Brexit. And I thought at the time, what a, what a mature uh, married couple they are, that they could have uh, very uh, different political opinions and yet be married to each other and engage that uh, political difference uh, in a mature and godly way. Uh, they were able to do that because their identity was first and foremost in Christ and not in their political opinion. This uh, example that this couple gave me, I I'd love to see multiplied many times over uh, in, in Jubilee and in Christian circles. As Christians, we are allowed to have uh, different views on how government should be run or what the correct medical uh, implementation is for the coronavirus or indeed what the best policies are for the economy. It, it is healthy and mature to have differing opinions. And friends, this isn't the time uh, for us to find our primary identity uh, in our political opinions, but rather it's a time for us uh, to find our primary identity in Christ and to treat others with love and respect. And then the final thing as it relates to uh, politics and the pandemic is I'd love to call you to pray. I don't know about you, but I find myself uh, being able to spend a lot more time trying to formulate my opinion around what I think the best government response should be or the best medical response should be or what the best economic response should be instead of spending my time and prioritizing my time on prayer. The reality is I'm not a political expert. I'm not a medical expert. I'm not an economic expert, but I am a follower of Jesus. And Jesus invites us to pray to him. Jesus invites us to pray for those that are in authority, that God would grant them wisdom and grace in order to lead wisely. Friends, as we are going through this turbulent and difficult time, where institutions are needing to make many difficult and complex decisions. Let's be the group of people that really pray for them. Let's be the people that cry out to God and ask God to anoint and help our leaders to lead for the common good and for the glory of God. So there we are. That was just great encouragement, great counsel and great advice. We really appreciate uh, Steve for putting that together for us. I uh, just want to say if you've got any questions or any challenges about anything that Steve has said, please would you give me a call. Let's chat about it. Let's talk about it. We, you may disagree. We may disagree, um, but it would be great to, to talk about that. So if you would like to talk a little about anything that Steve has, any of the issues that Steve has raised, please uh, give, me a, give me a shout. Just remember that the priority here is not to criticize or to correct, but rather to live peacefully 
and as effectively for the kingdom and for the gospel of Jesus as we possibly can in this season. Uh, all right, so uh, with that said, I'd love to just jump into today's message, which is entitled Freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ. Uh, we'll be reading from John chapter 8, and we're going to be asking a specific question this morning. What does it mean? What does it mean to have freedom in Christ? So uh, let's jump in. Let's go with our reading, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go into the message. John 8, verses 31 to 38. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and we've never been, been enslaved by anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed, or you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because of my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Jesus speaks here of freedom in Christ. What does it mean to have freedom in Christ? I want to just quickly say thanks to Sean and Rochelle. Thank you for your faithful encouragement through readings and through prayer. The encouragements that you've been posting on our WhatsApp group. Um, over the past weeks of, of lockdown. You guys are a real, real blessing. But let's just jump. What does it mean to have freedom in Christ? In John chapter 8, 36, Jesus makes this wonderful statement. It's a statement of victory. He says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. These are such powerful and encouraging words. But have you ever taken time to consider what you're free from. I've been thinking about this a lot. After all, we seem to be experiencing the same storm as everybody else at the moment. I don't, I don't feel like I'm freed from the storm that we're in. So we're, we're not free from that. And many of us have lost jobs. And some of us never had jobs. And so we're not free from the concern of of our jobs, having lost our jobs, or the concern of needing to find a job. Everybody has that concern, and, and we have it too. And what about sickness? Many of, of us have been sick, or we will be sick. Many of us carry ailments in our bodies that we haven't received healing from. So we don't seem to be free from that either. I've been thinking about this. And David seems to be troubled by some of the things in the Psalms. Listen to this in Psalm 73. He laments. He says, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. He, go <laughs> he goes on later. He says, this is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, and I've washed my hands in innocent, saying it's, it's, it's been for nothing. All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. Oh, David is in a low place. David is in a place of deep struggle, and, he, and this is in Scripture, so it's okay to speak this way. This is not a lack of faith. This is a lament. A, Oh, this life is hard. And when I look around, it doesn't look like I have any kind of special status, any kind of special freedom because of my love for God and my service to God and my, my joy in, in God. It, it feels like, in fact, it's worse for me than it is even for them. David is troubled. Where's the benefit of being God's, God's child, one of God, in, in God's family, one of God's chosen? What has God done for me since I turned to him? What is, it doesn't seem that I'm free. And if I'm free, what am I free from? And these were the questions that I was asking and have been asking this week and thinking about. 
David concludes with this answer in verse 27. He says, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So with all David's lamenting and crying out to God, he resolves in this place. Freedom is in the change of identity that God gives to us. It's the result of our transformation from sin to righteousness. And it's, the, it's most expressed in the reality that we can now be near to God. As for me, it's good to be near to God. David's saying, it, it, despite of all the things that I still struggle with, despite of all the challenges that still exist in my life, despite of the fact that in this world there seems to be such inequality around around who gets what and 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 who gets who 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 has much and who has little, despite all of that, as for me, it's good to ne be near God. David says that's the highest point for me, and he also says this before that he says those who are far from God perish. Those who are far from God will perish, and those who are near God, well, the opposite is true. They, 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 they will not. This wonderful expression of the reality that we can now be near to God. It's amazing to me that Terry Virgo, a wonderful church father, spoke on this very thing in a clip that he recorded this week. And it popped up on my timeline and I pressed it and I started listening to it. And I thought, I can't believe it. I'm in the middle of preparing this message. I'm in, in the middle of seeking the Lord and, and, and asking him to show me what it is that we're freed from. And, uh, and, and then I heard, I, I watched Terry and he shared this, this two minute clip. And so I want us to listen to that clip. Uh, I want us to hear what Terry had to say. So let's listen to that together right now. I spoke to you a couple of days ago about how Paul says you were darkness now you are light in the Lord, a dramatic change of identity. And we spoke about the importance of identity before activity. We need to understand the radical thing that God's done for us before we try living the Christian life. Christianity isn't us trying harder. It's not learning some new rules. It's a radical life change because we are in Christ. And when he was put to death, my old self, was put to death with him. I died with him. I've been raised with him to newness of life. And Paul says, now you're light in the Lord. He uses other imagery also to talk about this radical change. And one of them is that he says, you used to be slaves of sin. You used to be. Sin was master of you. Sin had control of you. Sin led you to making decisions. It dominated you. You were its slave. He says, but now, now you are slaves of righteousness. Again, it's not an exhortation. It's not an appeal. It's a statement. It's good news. This is who you now are. You are a slave of righteousness. It's rather like you're being in the slave market. Okay, so you're a slave. So your master, sin, says, come on, slave. Where are we going? We're going to the market. Okay. And then he goes. He says, well, stand there. Okay, I'll stand here. Then righteousness walks through the market and says, hmm, I think I might buy you. Oh, I'm a slave of sin. Yeah, I'll pay the full redemption price. I'll buy you out of your slavery. Well, will you? Okay. Well, he pays the full price. Okay, I'm not, I'm not a slave of sin anymore. Then righteousness says, no, 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 you're my slave now. Come on, here we go. And now you're in bondage to righteousness. Righteousness is your master. Righteousness is where you feel comfortable. Righteousness is your new identity. You're a slave of righteousness. That's why we feel so bad when we do sin. It's foreign territory to us now. It's not where we belong. It's not that we're still slaves of sin trying to improve ourselves. God has changed us radically. And we need to start thinking differently and then we start acting differently. But it starts with identity before activity. It starts with knowing before doing. God bless you through another day. Allow me to just expand a little more on what Terry has has said, not to improve on it, but just to expand on it and to expand on this question that we're asking us. What does it mean to be free? What is the, what is the freedom that we have in, in Jesus? 
the New Testament uh, part of the Bible was originally written in Greek. This part that we're reading uh, was originally written, written in Greek. And from the Greek, this word free can mean to liberate or to exempt from all liability. Freedom to free means to liberate or to exempt, to, to let off from all liability. You no longer have the liabilities that you had before. This means that what we could, we could do is we could read the verse like this. Whom the Son liberates or exempts from all liability will be really liberated and exempted from liability. We live in South Africa and one of the realities of our lives is our divided history. And while we celebrate Freedom Day on the 27th of April every year to commemorate the first post-apartheid elections, it's clear and obvious that we still have a long way to go before we're truly free. Our people have not really been liberated, nor has there really been real exemption from liability. We could be forgiven for lamenting as David did, asking God, why is it that nothing has changed? Why is it that, that even all these years after that first election, nothing has changed? Why is it that some people still seem to be prospering in their wicked ways and in their wickedness? Why has there been no change? And friends, the sad truth is that though we may make some strides in the right direction, it's unlikely, perhaps Never likely that any of us will be really free from this kind of strife in our lifetimes. And I don't want to be negative, and I don't mean to be negative, but it truly is unlikely. We've sinned against one another and God, and our greatest hope will be a constant commitment to repentance and forgiveness. The Bible, they talk about repentance and, and forgiveness and, and, and the conversation the disciples have with Jesus is how, how often do we need to forgive? And, and Jesus said a lot, often. He says 70 times 70. He just says keep, keep re offering forgiveness. And, and, and the question could be how often do we need to repent? How often do we need to repent for our wicked ways? And, and the truth is that that could also be considered Many times, 70, just keep repenting, keep repenting, not because you're never forgiven, but because, because the way of the world and the way of our hearts is, 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 is wicked always. And we, we always have things to repent of to one another and things to forgive one another for. How many times must forgiveness be offered? As often as many times as it is requested. And this is the way it is to be between between men because between us we can't reconcile between us we can't fully complete and close the loop of 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 forgiveness the freedom that we seek is beyond us all and we want freedom and we long for freedom but i can't give it to you and you can't give it to me and and many many times people and nations are stop stomping on one another's toes in an attempt to do what we almost cannot do. Should we not try? No, I, of course we should continue to work the way the way we are. But we should also realize that this is this is an ongoing wheel and we should not grow frustrated when we don't see the radical change that we wish we would see. The heart of man is wicked in many ways and the world that we live in is wicked in many ways. And even if we've received freedom and 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 forgiveness for our own sins and we've come to Jesus, we remain in a world that is terribly, terribly lost and mired in sin. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And with God, the freedom that we can't, we can't achieve is, is quite different in, 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 in his economy, in his terms. And today we want to just, that's what I want to zoom in on. I want to zoom in on what God does in setting us free and what he really sets us free from. If the sun sets free, you will be free indeed. As we look at that, and as we see it, that it has for us two wonderful conclusions. Firstly, that there are things that this Jesus has freed you from. And second, that there are things that Jesus has freed you into. As we look at those, both, both of those, oh, we find them to be wonderful. And we also find them to be critical to us as we live out the gospel. And so firstly, what has Christ freed you from? Or perhaps you would ask, 
What do I need to be freed from? The Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to were descendants of Abraham, the chosen people of God. And so by matter of birth, they considered themselves to be God's people. They didn't need freeing. They were slaves to no one. Well, at least they were in that generation. God had set them free from slavery in Egypt years ago, and he had defeated their enemies and given them victory over them. And so they asked, what do we have to be freed from? They, they asked that question, and perhaps that's the question you ask too. What did I need to be freed from? Or what do I need to be freed from? Well, the first thing is your captivity. Your captivity, your bondage to sin. To need to be liberated, we must have first been bound or imprisoned. To need to be set free, we must have been or be in a situation where we are not free. The life of a captive is restricted and it's confined. And that's exactly what we, are, we were, but we no longer are in Christ. You and I were prisoners held under the bondage of sin. We were held captive by the impulses of sin. I love the way Terry explained that. We were slaves to the instincts of sin. What sin told us to do, we did. We had no power to overcome the influence of sin. Sin was our master. Sin was our ruler. And it held us captive. In your days of living before Christ, whatever sin wanted, sin got. That doesn't mean to say that you were necessarily living a wild lifestyle. Maybe you were. I don't know what your lifestyle was. But it, it simply means this, that the authority in your life was your sinful nature. It gave you the impression that you were in control, doing what you wanted, getting what you wanted, enjoying life the way you chose to enjoy life. But in truth, you were out of control and sin was in control. In Romans 6, Paul refers to sin as your master. But when you were born again, something beautiful happened. Something extraordinary happened. Something quite amazing and miraculous happened. God gave you a new nature. A new nature. Not the one that, was, that you were born with. The one that was that was dead spiritually. God gave you a new nature and God did something more. He filled you with the with his Holy Spirit. And so now that you're born again, you're no longer under the control of your former sinful nature. Your old nature, your old sinful nature controlled you. This new nature that you have, you're not under control, means that you're not under control of that old nature. You have been set free. Romans 8 again, it says this, there is not, therefore now, <laughs> there was, there was, but now there isn't any more. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How is that possible? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. That's how it's possible. The law, the, the law of the spirit of life has come to set you free. Liberation to liberate you and to exempt you. The spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. There is that, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. The spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You and I have been given a new nature that is free from condemnation for the past, present and future condemnation. We are free from it all. And that's that is not enslaved to sin as your old nature was once before. This new nature is free from con condemnation and it's free from slavery. Now, you might still sin, but now it's different. Now you, your sin isn't natural and an obedient response to your master. Now your sin does, it causes a, a, a dislocation for you in your spirit where, where the Holy Spirit is with you. Now in, your, where, where, in order to sin, you have to go against your nature. When you are born again, 
when we sin, we do it by choice, not by default. It used to be by default, but, but according to this new nature, we do still sin, but it's by choice. How do we keep from sinning now? Paul sums it up well in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17. He says, now the Lord is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You and I, in our coming into freedom, have received the Holy Spirit. And it's by the Holy Spirit that God lives within us. And he is a spirit that conforms with, confirms within us that we are sons and no longer slaves. This Holy Spirit keeps us free. This Holy Spirit keeps us from sin. And because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are free. Free to choose life. Free to say no to sin. And yes to godliness. Yes to righteousness. Free from the bondage of sin. Free from the enslavery of sin. Which demanded you did what it says. You don't have to listen to the demands of sin any longer. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And friends, if you have chosen to follow Jesus, if you have repented and, and, and called on Jesus to forgive you of your sins, the Spirit of the Lord is with you. And He has bring, brought freedom to you. You are free from the bondage of sin. You're also free from the penalty of sin. And this is a huge thing because the penalty of sin isn't just a, a little bit of Comprom a, a little bit of consequence now in this lifetime. The penalty of sin is far greater than any consequence you might experience in this lifetime. The penalty of sin speaks to our eternity and our relationship with God into eternity. Not only were you enslaved to sin, you were also bound to receive the penalty or the reward for sin. It's possible that you thought the reward for sin was the pleasure you felt. When you did it, that's the reward. It feels good. The victory over your spouse in an argument. Yeah, I got it. I won that one. She's going to have to come and apologize to me now. Maybe you thought that was the victory. Agreement in your circle that you were right and the others were wrong. You're sitting there gossiping and talking and all your friends say, yes, you were right and affirm you against your, your other friend who is, is no longer there. Maybe you, th you feel like that agreement, that affirmation is, is, is your victory as you sin in gossip. Maybe the pleasure of overindulgence was, was the, the freedom and the, and, the, and the reward that you, you felt you got when you sinned. You ate and you ate and you ate and, oh, it feels so good. You drank and drank and it feels so good. You, you slept and you slept and it feels so good. You, you watched, binge watched and you binge watched and you felt so good. Oh, the sin has got a great reward. It makes us feel so good. Maybe you feel like the luxury of laziness. Oh, I can just sit back here and do nothing. And it's just such a beautiful thing to do nothing. Laziness is sin, friends. And, and, and its reward isn't that you just get to do nothing. It has a different reward. Sin often rewards us instantly. And it often rewards us well. And sometimes it has negative consequences too. We get credit card debts that now need paying. We lose the trust of our friends because we sin against them. Perhaps we develop poor health because we overindulge. Maybe that's the reward for our sin, this, this negative kind of short-term reward. Maybe, maybe we end up living in poverty because of our, 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 our laziness. Is that the reward for sin? Friends, there is, there is consequence in sin, immediate, and sometimes it feels good a little later, and sometimes that doesn't feel so good. But none of these are the ultimate reward for sin. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That is the ultimate reward for sin. Here is the truth, truth worth remembering. Outside of Christ, we had all, we all carried an eternal death sentence. You may not have understood it. You probably didn't. You probably didn't grasp the gravity of it, but that's where we were. And death in this context is not the loss of life. It's not, it's not physical, a physical death. It's far worse than that. 
Death is life with the absence of the fellowship of God. Death is life without the providence of God. Sadly today, many people still don't understand that because of our sin, you and I were to be eternally separated from the very presence of God. That's the wages of sin. That's the death that the Bible speaks to. And those who continue to re reject God remain dead. And they remain separated. And they remain separated for all eternity. That throughout this life and, and into your lives, into the grave, beyond. Eternal death is the eternal wage or penalty or liability for our sin. But God. But God. God is working redemption in creation. He is drawing men and women to be born again. Out of sin and separation and into righteousness and relationship with him. This is the free gift of God. The gift that God has given us. The gift that God wants to give us. That he wants us to receive. This is the gift of God that God wants us to remember we have been given. Your freedom from the penalty of sin. Your assurance of relationship with him. Now and into eternity nothing can separate us from the love of God friends Paul states here the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus when Jesus set you free he took away your death and he gave you life he gave you his life resurrection life for the first time in your life and forevermore you became alive truly alive the penalty that you deserved has been removed and you've now been given this eternal life. By grace, God in Christ Jesus literally shifted your current status and your eternal destiny. He changed it all. And that's why death has no sting. We do not fear like we used to or like others still do. And we don't ignore it or choose ignorance of it. No, we long for our life. After we die, we long for the time that we will have in eternity with God. Because freedom for us means freedom from the penalty of death. And we have freedom. Today you can rejoice because if you have Christ, then you have eternal life. It's a promise that is already yours. Fully yours. You no longer have condemnation. And in Jesus you will never be separated. From the love of God. And then. As we look at what this freedom is. And what we've been freed from. We're freed from the guilt. And shame. Of sin. Do you know what friends. The guilt and shame of sin. Can sometimes. Bear down in greater consequence. In greater ways. Than even the. Immediate penalty that we might feel the guilt and shame of sin can can bear down and crush us this is one of the things that we most of us struggle to live with and this is why we need to be reminded today that that the freedom jesus gives us gives us freedom not just from the penalty of sin not just from the nature that once used to love sin and couldn't help but sin he also frees us from the guilt and the shame of the sin that we have committed. This is an incredible gift of freedom. But we often struggle to receive it. Have you ever experienced the feeling of guilt? Have you ever experienced or felt shame for things that you've done in the past? I bet you have. Have you ever repented but felt like you needed to repent again because you feel so bad for what you did in the sight of God? Have you ever felt like you just can't move on? You feel like guilty. You feel even ashamed. And you fear what others will, will think. Friends, we've all done things that we are ashamed of. Things that we wish we could take back and never do again. We all have the capacity to relive our bad moments. Questioning, why did we do that? I just wish I had never done that. How could God ever forgive me of that? 
we feel shame and we feel guilt. I've done that so often. And guilt and shame haunts us all and it can haunt you and it can cripple you. It can take away your capacity to live and your capacity to grow. It stunts you. It weighs you down. It holds you back. It robs you of feeling that you are valued and that you are valuable. And that your life really means something. Guilt and shame is a thief. This is one of the biggest weapons of Satan. Encouraging you to look back at the shameful moments of your life. To overwhelm you with guilt. To overwhelm you with shame and condemnation. And to strip your joy, your joy to rob your peace, to destroy your vitality, the very urge to to live and to have joy but today friends i this news is such good news this news of freedom that we have because this news tells us that you've been set free from the guilt and the shame of sin when you sincerely repented for the first time god forgave you once and for all really he really did forgive you. Psalm 103 says this. Psalm 103. The Lord is com compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. In Psalm 103 verse 12, speaking of this day, to come which is which is now the psalmist wrote for i will be merciful towards their iniquities and i will remember their sins no more this is now this is this is now friends this is the freedom that jesus gives us it was for freedom that christ has set us free whom the son sets free will be free indeed this is what we're free from the very things that we needed most to be free from. He removed that sin. That sin that clings to you. That sin that holds on to you. He removed it as far as the east is from the west. And he doesn't remember it anymore. He will never bring it up again. And neither should you. Neither should you. Not, not in conversation with yourself. Nor in conversation with God. Nor in conversation with others. In this complete freedom Christ gives us, he doesn't just forgive the sins of the past. He liberates you from the shame and the guilt of the past. He takes away the thing that Satan would use to bring you down. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is no lie. This is the good news of the gospel that we do well to remember every day of our lives. Remember this. This is the truth that sets you free. If you are forgiven, you are forgiven completely and totally. Sin, shame, guilt, all of it is dealt with when Jesus sets you free. You don't have to carry that burden of guilt and shame anymore. You are forgiven and you're truly free indeed friends when you understand what christ has freed you from it sets a stage for you to live in what christ freed you into and so i want to quickly answer that question of how we then live in the light of this incredible freedom and first i want to say we stand firm we stand firm and we are not shaken. Galatians 5 says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. 
Do not submit again. Do not fall back into sin. Do not fall back into the slavery that sin longs to get you into a headlock and a hold for. Stand firm. For freedom Christ has set us free. Now stand firm and don't submit again. Root your feet onto and into the truth of this wonderful word. Turn your shoulder into life and anything that the enemy may try to bring you. Don't try and fry, fight it. Just stand firm. I know what the Son has done. He has set me free. I am free. You're trying to put that on me. You can't put that on me. I am free from that. Yes, I sin. I am forgiven. I am living forward by the grace and the power and the of the glorious King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hold your ground. Do not be deceived and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. That's how we live. How else do we live? We run. We run. We run for Jesus. I shared this last week with a group of people and I loved it so much that I want to share it with you again. Hebrews chapter 12. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, let's get rid of it. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition for, from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is Paul's great rallying cry. He's talked about the witnesses that are surrounding us, watching those who have gone in the past, those who have run their race, those who have carried the baton of the gospel, those who have lived out the freedom and embraced the freedom and the joy and the truth of Jesus. He says we're surrounded by this awesome great cloud of great witnesses and now it's our day now it's not dad who used to run now it's me who's running now it's not great granddad who used to run now it's us who are running and we are this is our time this is our day and he's saying run with perseverance throw off anything that's going to get in your way throw off anything that's going to entangle you and and you can throw it off because you have this wonderful new nature you have this wonderful new nature that has is empowered by the holy spirit and you can throw off anything that seeks to entangle you and you can run get into this Paul saying get into this race let's do life let's not hold back there's a race that's marked out for us this is our day we have witnesses and th that was their day and and they ran well but now the baton is on our hand and the gospel is now ours to share to embrace and to share run run how do we live now? Run. How do we live? Now that we have freedom, what do we do with it? We run. We don't closet ourselves away. We don't hide away in fear. No, we run. We don't watch others run. We don't just train and never run. We don't plan to run and, 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 and hope to run and long to run. Run, Paul said. Let us run. And he says, run with perseverance. There'll be hills and there'll be dry spells. <laughs> don't stop for that. Run with perseverance. Oh, get over those hills. Get through those valleys. God will always give you more than you can handle. God will always give you more than you can handle. So look to Jesus and keep looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of, of your faith, of our faith. He went before us and we're coming behind. We're coming behind. We're with Jesus. Oh man, this is going to be tough. It's going to take some perseverance. Of course you can't do it on your own. Let's do it with Jesus. Let's do it looking to Jesus. And also look to us. Look to you and me. Paul speaks of us. He's speaking of a community. He's saying, no, I'm not, it's not I'm running or you must run and I'll sit back. No, he's saying we're, going to, we're doing this together. Look to Jesus and let us, let us, let us speak more of, of more than doing things alone. We do life together. We run this race together. Backing and supporting one another. We live for God and we live for good. That's how we live. Friends, are you ready to do this thing? Are you going to let lockdown hold you back when it was for freedom that Christ set us free? When Jesus himself said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Are you going to live like you're not free? 
Are you going to allow for the fact that, that we can't gather together to mean that you can't have joy and life? Are you going to live? Are, are you going to submit to, to, to where we are? Or, or do you realize that we have been liberated? We have been liberated from the things that hold us back. We've been liberated from the nature that consistently goes to sin and can't, has no, no, defenses against us we've been set free from that we've been liberated from the 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 condemnation of sin we've been liberated from the guilt and the shame that we feel when we sin friends we've been we've been set free we've been set free by the wonderful power and blood of jesus if you haven't yet been set free, I want to say that you can be. Even today, you can come to Jesus and say, Jesus, the weight of my sin is on my shoulders and it's way too heavy for me to bear. Would you, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you forgive me of my living for self? Would you forgive me of all that I have done just by default in the natural course of my life that, that is just, just apart from you? Would you bring me back into the presence of the Father? If you were to pray a prayer like that, God would hear that prayer and he would definitely forgive you of your sins. He would cleanse you with righteousness. So he'd give you a new heart and a new nature. One that is filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and one that enables you now to, to, walk, to walk out the rest of your life not sinning. To walk out the rest of your life with joy. To walk out the rest of your life overcoming and pushing back to walk out the rest of your life without the 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 hindrance and the weight of the guilt and the shame whom the sun sets free is free indeed it was for freedom that christ has set us free let's live in that freedom lord jesus this morning we receive your freedom we receive your grace we receive your loving kindness we thank you lord jesus that there's nothing that we can do to qualify for this, this is a free gift that you give to us. This morning we receive it again. And we choose to live in it. We choose to live in this freedom. We choose not to consider that we are under condemnation of any sort. Because, because we've been set free and they're free from, from, from guilt and shame and condemnation. We, we refuse to submit to the fact that we, we are held back. We, we choose today to, be, to, to, to shake off. All that seeks to hold us back. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we choose to shake it off, to, 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 to leave it behind and to run, to run with perseverance, looking to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured. We too are happily going, willing to endure. And we look forward, Jesus, to the time that you have promised that we will be together with you in eternity. Thank you for your presence in our lives now. Thank you for your presence in our homes right now. Thank you for your provision and your kindness. Thank you for your, your the nearness that we know that we have. We may lack a lot. We may lack everything, but we do not lack in the presence of God. We have that. That is ours. We do not lack in the assurance of our salvation. We do not lack in the freedom that we have been given. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for your loving kindness. I just want to end now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you, City Lights and friends. We long to see your faces. We long to be together again. Be strong and be bold and be very courageous. Run. Run, friends. Amen.